foolishness that is. Um, welcome to City Arts. So glad to have you all here tonight. You're in for a treat tonight, a double treat tonight, uh, with Steve Langan and, and Lance Larson. Um, good stuff. It's been an awesome uh, National Poetry Month. Uh, please come back the first Wednesday of May, and in my brain, I can't figure out which, which what's going on there. But please come back for that. Oh, I know exactly who's there. Tim Erickson has come. Tim Erickson is my, my buddy up the canyon in immigration. He's got a brand new book of poems out. He's going to be reading from that. And Paul Ketzel, the fiction writer who just had his first novel published, is going to be reading here that first Wednesday of May. So make sure to come back for that. The second Wednesday of May is when we celebrate the youngsters in the community, the high school writers from uh, all around uh, the valley and, and up north and down south uh, that will come here and entertain us and see what the future of Utah poetry looks like in Utah fiction and nonfiction and slam and God knows what else might happen. Uh, but uh, come back for that, May will be good. Uh, so tonight we're gonna start with Steve Langan and I'm, gosh, I've only got half of his uh, intro here, so I'm just going to, you know, I'll get him up here and he'll tell you exactly who he is by reading poems. But I'm so glad to have him here. They're traveling from Nebraska on their way down to uh, uh, down to Santa Monica, California, and we're happy to have them in Utah. Uh, Steve Langan, born in Milwaukee and raised in Omaha, he earned just degrees from the University of Nebraska and the University of Iowa workshop. Uh, he's the author of Freezing, Notes on Exile, and Other Poems, and Meet Me in the Happy Bar. And what it looks like, how it flies. So please welcome, welcome Steve Langman. Thanks for having us. Uh, and we're here partly, mainly through the uh, through. Uh, the generosity of our friends over there at Sugar House Review. What a great, prominent literary journal that's uh, become. If you don't know about it, it's right here in your own backyard. It's a great magazine. Jerry Van, one of the one of the editors, is right back there. Uh, what it looks like, how it flies, is the debut publication of, of uh, Gibraltar Editions, which is based in Nebraska. There's a bit of a legacy here. There was a printer in our state, a uh, bookmaker uh, named Harry Duncan, who had Abattoir editions and before that coming to the press. And his son, Guy Duncan, wanted to pay homage to Dad, and he brought in one of his dad's protégés, her name is Denise Brady, and they made two editions of a fine arts letterpress book, uh, 16 of my poems, one wrapped in vellum, all of this sort of hard work, right? Well, it's not work that hard, we just write this well. I shouldn't give away the secret. Some of us write them very quickly. Anyway, uh, the uh, launch for the uh, Fine Arts Books was uh, last month in, in Nebraska. And I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to be here reading with Lance Larson. Thanks again for having me. I'm going to get right into a little bit of a trance here and read you some of these, some of these poems. <clears throat> the Midwest. I remember this old guy at the bar where I worked gestured toward a girl seated with friends at a round table and said, you really need to learn to pause, study the small of a woman's back, the parallel lines curving upward, are her shoulders little shouts or whispers, in her neck slightly untuned, does it plead to know how best to begin to pursue her? But I was mainly interested in scoring then, in showing you how many bottles I could hold aloft in the dim light, and getting and staying loaded for days at a time. It's rude to talk too much about yourself. That's what we learn here in the Midwest. Days are numbered. We ask you to contribute to the bottom line, to catch each other in your sullen reproaches, crashing swoons, Make it look easy these next squalid hours. Some little nitpickers claim we're improving, but we can't all be angels of mercy or pain, hunting and gathering, failing and building, saving nothing for later, sleeping it all off. <clears throat> the 
is called cubicles. We met during evacuation drills, both of us slyly leaning. We met at lunch, then dinner. Days get long. You've seen Marianne reach to touch herself? Keep it to yourself. You felt the continent shift? A poem is more than just a celebration. No matter what the master tells you, put in some blood. Good. Graffiti on the walls, bloody graffiti. Good. Good. The goal? Fame? Yeah, I worked in a cubicle once, too. Make the phone calls, put a dollar in every envelope that passes, resist otherwise. Bullshit with Kevin, Sue, Dan. On the birthday cards, right now, just your name, but a remark. Add an exclamation point. Take walks at lunch, long walks. See someone you know, a flip of the hand will suffice. He doesn't seem his old self. I remember when he was happy. Some people express their joy through laughter, or a lilting voice, or eyes that twinkle, and some of us keep it all inside. Ugly kids. Some people are so ugly when they're sleeping, you want to take their temperature. And some people, it has been explored shamelessly, are so beautiful lying on the beach, so perfect, you cannot assume they lack depth or altruism. Kissinger got laid a lot. Women tracked him down, one even bribed the Secret Service just for a chance to talk with him on Miami Beach, under an umbrella and his large eyeglasses. Power is an aphrodisiac, he said. I looked up aphrodisiac. I looked up power. My sister said I smiled like a clown. That was 1979. There was no paradise to be found. Other days I was a chimpanzee. I could run all day and climb and scratch. There was this kid in our neighborhood who, so impeccably ugly, did not care what he said or did or to whom. I admired him. Plus, he was the first on our block to smoke with no apparent fear of getting caught, which says a lot about a boy's character. 25 years later, many of these people start to come into your life. Blame technology. Consider yourself warned. All but the one who truly fascinated us, over whose whereabouts, opinion, and future we speculated endlessly back when there was nothing else to do but think. The Originals. <clears throat> He's trying all of a sudden so hard to clearly mimic the lofty new originals as a way to demonstrate he was truly paying attention to the culture the last 30 years made our little group wince. I winced. And I haven't winced, really eyes and teeth winced, in a decade. I think I blushed. I know I sighed. I paced frantically and I looked out the kitchen window, though I could tell you the first thing I saw out there. I hollered at Eileen. Eileen, I hollered, come out here and look at this bullshit. But she was at work, at the hospital. She's always like kids, even sick ones. She knows how to talk to them. Eileen doesn't need to stick to the text like I do, the little onesie twosie questions such as school, which, subject, favorite. She knows how to listen to. Thank God I have Eileen in my life, but I need her now. Or someone who understands you don't just wake up one morning, walk outside to grab the paper, and get shot in the head. Only those who commit entirely to the life die in the sudden gunfire they wait their whole lives for. And even when we realize the love-hate on our knuckles never varnishes off. Even when we've almost forgotten the name of the cause we are going out to fight for. Even if they slaughter our babies and cut off their earlobes as a symbol. 
We never turn or run away. Anything else, I tell Eileen, is child's play. Three observations about women in a haiku. Women don't seem to need to lie nearly as much to each other as men lie to other men and especially to women. As I age, I admire more how women give compliments, multiple compliments, their range, specificity, lack of restraint. I love your name, Carla. My beautiful friend is also named Carla. We had a conversation about fun, and X, a man, said, if it's not fun, why would you do it? A stance of X's I've always admired. Women love him too, for this and many other reasons. Our beautiful world, we had all the lights turned off, the sound muffled too. I'll read you two more of the sort of book end to the <clears throat> first one I read. It's called The Northeast. I live part of the year on an island off the coast of Maine, and, and I live there. Almost, there, might, there may be other people there too, but it's mostly my wife's family. <laughs> Lovely people. So this is about, it's essentially about them. Us, I mean, us. It's called the Northeast. Poetry is dead. That's why we adore it. I saluted the mercenaries as they approached the chamber. The shamans attended the symposium. Wastrels pulled weeds in grandmother's garden. Just another day in the northeast. The wind settled, then blew. We all talked on our phones and assembled in circles on the road, seven or eight of us, then went to the bar. I meant to order the drink with a funny name and one for the uncle of the bride, but decided instead to take a walk. These places and actions, the bar, a walk, made me think of other bars and walks. Made monumental, we strolled into a blast of headwind. The siren on her stoop, the bell in the east, ring ring, our endless conversation. Later, we go for a ride in the boat and the fog comes in. And now we're navigating via compass, like the time before and the time before that. Thanks again for having me. I'm going to read you this poem called Bedtime Stories. It's in uh, five line, unpunctuated stanzas, and uh, I'll just take it from there. Jerry likes the beginning of this poem. He's being critical of me. It's a poem, not me, when I say things, Jerry. I'm going to try to teach you these things. <laughs> it's called Bedtime Stories. It's not that I don't like nature. It's just that it's everywhere. The ruins and sarcophagi, natives with machetes making minimum wage, truckers misspelling the names of states. I went out for a walk with Grandpa that didn't end. I fell in the lake again. By the fire, he warmed my clothes. He was a stern man, but kind to me. Believe me when I say I'm not going to make up anything. The day before wavered, and the day before that, we were fireflies in a bottle. When one of us was hungry, the others prayed more determinedly. When one of us was tired, another started to sing. It was nice to have such good friends, but giving up the faith still felt necessary. 
Standing alone one day, I realized what had occurred and how far we had come and how long it had been. I want to report back from what you called my special orbit, a long, overnourished missive about interdependence, a manifesto without the seriousness. If there is safety in numbers, count me in. I've gotten so old I can hardly fantasize. You never think these things will happen. That car sure has a funny alignment. I'm just getting a tune-up, then I'll pick up the bread and milk. Oftentimes he sits amid the crowd at the park and on holiday whistles as he looks in the windows of the trusty little boutiques. Yet a harsh feeling burns through this innocent scene. Remember resting my hand beneath her purple blouse? She was nibbleless in the sunny afternoon. We were poor kids together until her father's company went public. And the almighty epigraph is dead. Dogma is nearly dead. The beautiful is alive and well. Let's refuse to retreat. Let's refuse to say no to beauty. Are you for or against beauty? Sure, beauty is overrated, but still we're talking about beauty here. In the butterfly's freedom, represented by silence, I felt peace, then she flew away. In sync, in purposeful rhythm, one of those days today, but as soon as the ease was acknowledged, it was the frenzy again descendant. Bags of birdseed from May 14 to June 20 are on sale. Hitched to a star of your wagon, Justin. Unless I was drunk, I could never talk to that girl, Jasmine. In such plain spectral language, all I can survey is this billionaire of corn and wheat. Even the prices of the spices have gone up. A little candy for you and a little for me. Holiday traffic to contend with, damn it. We walked while we talked about the history of the town. To me, it's the dullest part of any journey. I've been trying to register the exclamations, feathers from all kinds of common birds, true and sure and willing to lead and be led. But as she moved clockwise, then counterclockwise, and we were all supposed to stay seated, that was the longest 45 minutes of my life, prayer in the morning, try to do this every day. I'm just writing in my notebook and thinking of you. They say embrace reality, then they go away. An eternal conversation, two squad cars backed up, two cops talking to one another, windows unrolled, baby toys, lawn boys, trademark, happy times, sucking thumbs. This is the chain of command. Jim, Julie, Ed, Heidi, and Desiree. If Jim is out of the office, call Julie. Prayer in the morning. Do this every day. Passing the sleepers on the way to the XYZ gymnasium. In the doll origination, the pamphlets and manifestos secure in their little pouches, darling little neighbor girls in their ponchos. It really wasn't much of a challenge because that's how we do things around here. A story that ends, even if we knew where to find it, even if we knew where to look, in examinations, in MRIs, one finds all sorts of things the patient thought might be there. Substantial blemishes, for instance, and little gravestones.